Hey, it's Mistress Carrie, reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 52 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Digital Federal Credit Union, better known by all of us as DCU. Now, not only is DCU a great place to bank at, but they are also a great place to work at, and they are hiring right now for full and part-time positions for several of their branch locations throughout Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So if you, a friend, or a family member is looking for a career change or to start a new career at a credit union, making a difference for their members and their employees, then visit dcu.org slash careers. DCU is proud to be an equal employment opportunity and affirmative action employer. So just log on to dcu.org slash careers. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by mistresscarry.com. The events calendar on mistresscarry.com is growing every day with concerts, parties, and appearances. Plus, you can check out my blog, my photo galleries, every episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast, the weekly episodes, the situation reports, the after action reports, and all 134 episodes of my weekly video show on Facebook, Cocktails in the War Room. Plus, you get all the links to all of my socials, and you can shop in the official online Mistress Carrie store. Just log on to mistresscarry.com. Okay, this week, it's Chris Daughtry. He's my guest on the Mistress Carrie podcast. Of course, he's the front man from the band Daughtry, who has new music out right now and has a new album coming out later on this year. You may remember Chris Daughtry, of course, from American Idol, but he's proven throughout the years that he's not a reality star. He's a rock star. And we had a fantastic conversation about music and inspiration and coming from a competition show on television and trying to be taken seriously in the rock world and dealing with major record companies and the challenges and the benefits that come from that. And now what it's like to be an independent artist. And of course, what it was like to ride out the COVID-19 lockdown at home with his wife and kids. And little did I know that he was going to drop this amazing cover, this duet with Lejean Witherspoon from Seven Dust, who we talk about in the episode. Chris and I got along awesome, and he is such a great guy, and I cannot wait to see him in person so I can get that hug he was talking about. If you thought you knew Chris Daughtry, this interview may just prove you wrong. So allow me to introduce you to Chris Daughtry. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to... You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Okay, now we can talk about whatever you want, Mr. Daughtry. We're recording now. It's official. You're on the record. Awesome. It's nice to How finally are you? meet you. I'm doing great. How are you doing? Nice to meet you as well. Um, it feels like it should have been sooner, but here we are. Yeah, you you are friends with a lot of the same people that I'm friends with, so it's strange that we've never spent any time together, but I'm glad that we are, even though it's still in this weird digital COVID way. 
And now we're going to be friends so we can all be one big circle of friends. That's right. That way, when we're around the seven dust guys or something, it'll really get off. the Exactly. Hook. Exactly. <laughs> the first thing I want to do is compliment you on your room. Um, when COVID happened and my um, radio station WAF went off the air, I had to build my own studio. And so yeah. this is my studio, MCHQ. Your room is, you've got a life-size Deadpool and, and Batman. <laughs> I mean, you're yeah, and um, purple lighting. Your room is cool. You, you can compliment it all you want, and I will take it gladly. But if you saw behind this camera, it is a full-blown shit show. I've got, I've got laundry that was done days ago that I haven't put away. It's, um, I've, I feel like I've been living in, in complete chaos mode for the past, I don't know, year and a half. <laughs> well, you... but, um, but thank you. Thank you. I, everything on this side of the camera, I'm okay with. Yeah, it looks great. And for all of us, I think we've learned a lot about ourselves over the last year and a half, right? We've learned a lot about... Yes how we like things. We've learned a, a lot about our partners, our family structure. For a touring musician, you've spent a lot of time at home. More than I have in 15, actually maybe more than I have in our entire marriage. Um, uh, but yeah, definitely more than I have in 15 years. And that's, you know, that was terrifying at first. That that first uh, that first two weeks when we thought it was going to be two weeks, we're like, oh, this is not too bad. And then that turns into six weeks. And I'm like, who am I? You know, <laughs> uh, my identity was I didn't realize how much of it was just wrapped up in uh, being on the road. Uh, my self-worth, everything was wrapped up in road life and being praised every day for how great I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, <laughs> and I'm, I was like, my, 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 uh, compliment cup was, was getting empty. And I was just like, I need to, I need to get out on the road again. And I was like, um, I, I realized, uh, I, I, there's a lot for me to learn about myself and how to be a better father, a more present partner and husband. And I saw very quickly all the shit that my wife deals with when I'm not here and it sucks so bad. <laughs> and I feel so bad for all the times that I called, Oh, hanging out with Lejean. Oh, you'll never believe who I met today or all this, you know, <laughs> all this road life excitement. And, and she's, she's just, elbow and deep in diapers and laundry and dishes. And, and I'm just wondering like, why aren't you excited for me? <laughs> <laughs> I've been joking that, when, when COVID goes away, you're either getting divorced or your marriage or relationship is rock solid for the rest of your life because you really are getting put to the test when you're locked in a house, not just with a wife, but with four kids. I mean, and yeah. downshifting a life where you're not used to being home and they're not used to you being around. Yes, yes. Now it's become like just second nature. And, um, but yes, we're, we're coming up on 21 years in November. And let me just tell you that I've given her every possible reason to, uh, go elsewhere. And this year was, uh, you know, really no different. And it, it forced us to deal with some things that, that, that we were able to, ignore for a while and I could ignore because I could just go, Oh, time to go back on tour. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, it was a very introspective year for all of us, I think for everybody. And it was either going to make you face those things and be a better person or go completely the other way. And, uh, I think in the beginning it was very tempting to just go the other way, you know, um, for me, you know, I, I, you know, started drinking at like noon. <laughs> and, I think everybody and, started drinking at noon. And, I started a I started a video show called Cocktails in the War Room and and I and I drink every Tuesday night because it's part of the show. Yeah, and it, at first it felt like well, what else am I going to do? It's corona, you know what I mean? Like what what are you going to do? And then I realized like 
I actually don't, I can't remember the last time I went a day without it. <laughs> and, and that kind of made me kind of analyze like the last 15 years of my life on the road and analyze the last, you know, just a lot of behaviors. And, and um, yeah, so I think, I think it was a good thing for me, my own personal development and my own soul uh, that, that all of this happened because I would have just went back to, you know, ignoring a lot of things about myself and, or not even being aware of certain things, really. Uh, the awareness was a, was a huge, huge thing. Well, you are an anomaly when it comes to marriage because you've you've been married so long as an entertainer, which is pretty rare. I got married in the middle of COVID. So I just got married. Oh, at congratulations. The end. Thank you. I got married at the end of August. And what were you thinking? <laughs> he he's active duty military, was getting ready to deploy, and I was like, I gotta lock that shit down. Yes. So yeah. I locked it down, but as a new is he man, home still? Is he home still, or did he get deployed? He's no, he got deployed three weeks after the oh. wedding. Oh and, uh, shit, that sucks. He's actually back temporarily on leave, but he's only back for a few mm-hmm. days, and then he leaves again and won't be back till next year. So it's it's a long, it's a long haul. So that's why I was asking you. You know, I lo- I do a lot of work with the military, and and obviously I'm not putting military service on par with being a rock star. But there are a lot of similarities that have come up in this podcast about lifestyle things and relationship struggles because of the separation and the distance and the travel and the dynamic of the family. Those things are all the same. Yes, but you guys have it much harder because I know when I get to come home, you know, when I'm on on the road, I'm like, I'm out five, six weeks. I know the people in the military, I feel so bad. Like half the time they don't know when they're coming home. If they're coming home, you don't know where they're at because they can't tell you. And, and like, that seems like, like, I don't even know how you, you all deal with, with that. That seems like just this, um, just this, the huge amount of uncertainty that goes along with that has to be such a test and, and patience and your own sanity. I'm pretty new to it, so I'm getting I'm getting used to it all, especially through the lockdown. The other thing that I've noticed is that it takes a certain kind of woman to be able, or, or a certain kind of partner, I should say, because there's a lot of yeah. female rock stars and female yeah. deployed military personnel. It takes a certain kind of person to be able to handle life at home, like what you were talking about with your wife, being able to juggle everything because you're always gone. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I don't know if I would be able to do it if the roles were reversed. Uh, I I would, um, yeah, I would probably be in a mental institution. <laughs> well, you you've had a lot of quality time with the family. Yeah, and you've grown a magnificent COVID beard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Has there been some things that you started doing to keep yourself occupied both personally and or with the family that you hope stick around now that COVID and you know, that the vaccinations are starting to work? And did you start new hobbies? Did you start doing new activities that you're like, you know, I wish I had started doing this before. I love this. Um, honestly, I think it made me, um, as far as my own personal life and personal, you know, career stuff, it made me way more involved and engaged than I've ever been in my career from the artwork to the, you know, uh, everyone who's involved with it. I'm hands on from the ground up. And and I think a lot of that comes from just being independent as an artist now and not being on a major label. And I have nobody telling me what I should be doing or what I shouldn't be doing or um, you know, even the, the videos are, are like, I'm coming up with all these concepts and I never did that before. And I don't know why, maybe it was because I was new to the industry and just thought, well, this is just how it goes. You know, record label says you're going to shoot a video. Here's some treatments. You pick the one that sucks the least and go with it, you know? And, um, and I, you know, I, I don't think I ever felt like I could do what I actually want to do. 
and uh, World on Fire was was the first um, kind of dive into that that world of me kind of not directing but directing and finding someone to kind of see my vision through and heavy as the crown video. Uh, it, we're still working on that, which has turned into something very cinematic and and cool. And it is a continuation of the last video, which is something I've always wanted to do and just never felt like I had anyone that had my back to help me see that through until now. Um, so that's been all consuming that and some other things that I'm working on around the album that I can't really talk about right now. But as far as like hobbies and personal, you know, like family stuff, I think I'm just more involved with everything. I'm calling, uh, you know, doctors. I'm I'm setting appointments. I'm I'm getting people out to the house when something gets, you know, needs fixing where all of that was on my wife before. And more people have my cell phone number now than ever. (laughs) <laughs> like, and I just, I just, I just finally had to say, I don't give a shit. Like, like everybody in Tennessee has my phone number now, apparently. <laughs> and, and I'm just, I've had to be okay with it. My ego has gone from like the stratosphere to the floor. You know, I've had to just let go of so many things that I thought I was or thought, you know, um, well, you got to give your phone number out. I'm famous. You know what I mean? Like, all this stuff you tell yourself and I've had to, and I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I think I've picked up on a lot of books and podcasts because I, you know, had nothing else to do. And, um, a lot of gym time I've, I've kind of replaced bad habits with the gym and I was already kind of doing that, but I was combining them. (laughs) You can justify the hamburger with extra bacon. If you went to the gym that morning and it's like, well, you're not really gaining anything you're just maintaining at that point just just going right across yeah Yeah. i'm good Um, with this dad bod if i go to the gym and then i can eat that giant plate of spaghetti and meatballs (laughs) um so yeah um just just um being more involved at every level i it used to be so separated and now i've which is kind of it's been great in that respect but it's also terrifying the thought of going back out on the road and and how to maintain what we've built this past year and a half and and try to still keep those um those roles interconnected as opposed to just like well i'm gone so you can deal with all that so i got to figure out a way to still um you know be of service in that way when you talk about working on your own artwork and your own videos. I know that you're a huge fan of, I mean, you could tell by the room you're sitting in, of graphic novels <laughs> and illustration. Yeah. Do you have that ability at all or can you just appreciate it in other people? Are you actually drawing things out? Is that something you do? Yes, I, um, I am uh, actually, I wanted to be a comic book artist when I was a kid, way before I found music. So. I've had the opportunity to do, I've done a few covers for Batman and um, Youngblood and Spider-Man, but I've never really dove in and and made it, you know, a full time. Every time I draw, it feels like the first time. I'm always having to like kind of retrain the brain. It's it's a very difficult bike to ride. It's not as easy as just jumping on um, for me anyway, because I don't do it enough. I wish I'd I wish I had the drive to sit at a day, a table and draw every day, but I just don't, but I have the ideas. And when it comes, you know, time to, you know, lay stuff down, I, I do my homework a little bit and then uh, it's, you know, it kind of comes back, but yeah, a lot of this art is mine. And, uh, I've, uh, I've always been an artistic person and then music came along and, and I'm one of those people that, I can give, I can be great at one thing and I can give everything I have to one thing, but it's really hard for me to give everything I have to multiple different things. So anytime I'm focused on the music, everything else takes a backseat. When I'm focused on the art, the music takes a backseat. And I'm trying to get better at that and, and how to kind of, you know, balance them out a little bit better. But 
there is a lot of that that's been involved in this project. So it's kind of kept me on my toes a little bit. See, I'm the exact opposite. I can manage a bunch of different things at the same time, but I'm not fantastic at any of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm average or a little above average, yeah. but I can do the six things at once. Right. But I can't take all that energy into one thing and make that one thing amazing. I I don't Um, know if it's a boredom thing. I don't know if it just, I hit my ceiling of, of what I'm capable of. I I don't know what it is. Well, I personally have OCD and ADHD, which is a terrible combination because I, if, if I'm not doing perfect at the thing that I'm focused on, then, then I'll beat myself up. And that, that goes for, tracking vocals or, or working on a a comic book cover or working on, um, laundry, you know, like I'm, I am like, it's got to be great and it might not be, but it's gotta be great in my mind. (laughs) And, uh, and so it's really hard for me. And then, and then my, my, you know, my ADHD kicks in and then I'm, I'm on to the next thing. And, and then I'm all into that or all into that. You know, I have and you better not fold span. it wrong because your wife has a way of folding it. And now that you're home, no, I I have a way oh! of folding it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm all the time going. I'm biting my tongue a lot. I'm biting my tongue a lot. She's she's good, and she has taught me certain ways that she likes it, and I have perfected it. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you started to tell me before I hit record and I stopped you. Although she makes a bed much better than me. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, You have ties to New England and Massachusetts, which I find very interesting. I do. do. My my wife and her family are from Boston, Bridgewater, Brockton area. She went to she went to Brockton High School. And every now and then that Brockton comes out. Well, and, that's and it exactly, is, it is a real, it's real. It is a real tangible personality. That's what that I is. was going to ask you because my husband <laughs> is not from New England. And uh-huh. when I try to explain the differences in people, specifically women from this region of the country, he doesn't quite understand it all the time, but that Boston broad comes out and yeah. and and you're experiencing it too. And Brockton's no joke. That's a tough place. She's a tough girl. She, she took me through there a few a couple years ago. We were visiting some of her family at a family reunion, and she was like, "I just want to take you where I grew up." I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Get me the fuck out of here." right now because i swear to god someone's following us and we're in a rental car and it looks like we have way too much money we need <laughs> we need to bail <laughs> my high school and, uh, football team beat brockton in the super bowl when i was in high school and yeah. and all of the people from my school were like these guys are going to stab us in the face <laughs> <laughs> she when she gets pissed off we call her brockton d like it's, it's, um, it's, it's real. It's laughable and real at the same time. And because you're, but we just don't, we don't want to be the ones that are the, the catalyst for that, that, uh, you know, that side of her. But if we're on the non receiving end of it and we get to watch it from afar, it's really fun. Well, that's, you, <laughs> there's gotta be a certain thing because you're a Southern guy and you're, yeah. and you're living down there taking, taking her and putting her you know, like driving with her, right? She's yelling and honking and there's certain traits that you get up here that you got to be moving. It must have been a downshift for her to slow down. So she, she went from uh, Massachusetts to California uh, at an early age. So she was way more cultured than I was uh, when we met. And I grew up in the South. I, you know, I barely left the state. So, um, But with that being said, we're both the worst people behind the wheel. Like we're both, (laughs) we are, we have no, I'm, I'm way more like assertive as a, as you know, because I have a Tesla, so it goes really fast. So I'm like, I don't have time for this. I don't have time. I can get in and out. 
she's she's not much like that but we're both the most impatient people period and and here where we live people have a really bad habit of going under the speed limit that's a bad day for me like i i can't like everything it tests everything that i've i've tried to get rid of in meditation it all comes back. <laughs> My husband's stationed down there. That's why I'm asking these questions. Because when he is stateside and I go to visit him down there, it drives yeah. me crazy. Yes. Because it's becoming like this, you know, um, smorgasbord of people from everywhere. Yet the locals, it's still very much, you know, it's not a, it's not a city to them. They're still... They're still 20, 30 years ago before it blew up. And so they're still coasting. <laughs> and we're like, there's places to go. <laughs> Do you like having a Tesla? Everybody I know that has one loves it. I, I don't think I've ever liked driving more. Really? Yeah. I stopped getting rides places. I'm like, I like, I, I like driving too much now. Yeah, I do. I love it. I and want- my kids love riding in it. I don't know if it's because it looks like a spaceship or, or what, but they just love being in this. And, and it's not as much room as my wife's Subaru, but they just love being cramped in this pod and it feels like they're traveling to the moon, I guess. Did they, did they ask you to customize the horn? You can make the horn like any noise you want, right? So you can make it like a fart noise or something. Every now and then I'll mess with them and I'll, I'll, cause, cause you can actually move. So there's a screen where you can move the, the whoopee cushion to whichever seat and you can actually direct it to a specific seat. It's hilarious. And you can, you can change it. So when you turn it on, you can p- program it. So the turn signal farts every time. <laughs> Isn't it amazing hilarious. that we've got all this technology that Elon Musk is trying to send stuff to Mars and yet he's making a car that makes fart noises. Yes. And and uh, I don't know why my manager is trying to call me right now and I'm on a Zoom call. <laughs> probably trying um, to make sure that you're on this, the call, probably. It's like when we were kids, the future was like the Jetsons. They and and they didn't even have cell phones or, or you know, uh, FaceTime or anything. We have cars that fart like they had no idea what was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I was really excited to talk to you, not knowing we'd talk about farting cars, but you have ridden this amazing journey of ups and downs in the music business. And especially now as an independent artist and and getting ready to release a new record, basically on your own in this, I hate to be cliche, but in this like post COVID, whatever this uncertain future is going to be. Somebody like myself that spent a lot of years at a radio station that right before COVID got sold, like a legacy rock station that then just one day was just gone. I've had to do a lot of that soul searching that you talked about, trying to figure out your identity, trying to figure out who you Mm. are. You started in rock and roll for the masses anyway, the public consciousness Mm -hmm. in a really difficult way because you started on television in a way that a lot of rock fans kind of rebelled against. And you took a lot of crap oh, yeah. for it. And, yeah. you know, I was one of those people that was like, oh, okay, here we go. American Idol is going to tell us who the next yeah. rock stars are. You know what I mean? And you've risen to levels of fame, major record deals. And now you're going into this new time in your career where you are in control of everything. Do you have regrets about how certain things in your career have gone or are you of that mindset that, you know what, I'm here and this is where I want to be and it's all good? It would be really easy to, to look back on those things and be like, I should have done this. I should have done that. And I could do that all day. There's, there's moments where, you know, I wonder if saying no to something was a bad move or saying yes to something was an even worse move. Um, but the, the reality is every one of those decisions taught me exactly what I needed to know right now. And, you know, I was fortunate enough that I didn't win. So I came in fourth and nobody was really lording over me to make that first record. And for the most part, it was a rock record through and through. And I was very happy with how it turned out with the exception of a couple of songs that were kind of 
you know, um, pushed on me by the label. But I was like, this is new for me. What do I know? Let's play ball. And I was able to get Slash on my first record. So I was like, win. That's a win. Um, I got Slash's respect. I can do a couple songs I didn't write. You know what I mean? And I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll swallow that pride. And then the second record comes along and I was able to still have, I felt like I still had my, my footing where I was able to, to call the shots, but I started to feel a little more of the kickback, a little more of the pushback on some of those decisions. And then by the third record, it felt like I had to really dig my heels in. And then by the fourth record, I kind of got tired. I got tired of fighting and not to mention I was working with a different a and person every time after the first uh, record. So now I'm getting people that don't really know me, that don't really know what we're about as a band. And they're giving me their version of what they think we are and what we, they think we should be and the kind of music we should be doing to stay relevant, to stay successful, to stay on this chart. To Let me stop you for one on, second, because if yeah. for people that are listening that don't know what an A&R person is, I want to make sure that yeah. they understand the role of this person from the record perspective in your career. Yeah, so this person is the one who is, you know, helping you um, develop the vision for the record. They're, they're, they're listening to all the songs in real time going, hmm, Maybe, maybe this isn't the right fit. Maybe this isn't going to work on radio. Um, maybe you should do it with this person instead. Maybe you should use this producer. Maybe you should, you know, they're, they're there to help facilitate, supposedly help facilitate your vision. And I was very fortunate enough to have, you know, Ashley Newton and Pete Gambarg on the first record who worked, you know, Ashley worked with the Foo Fighters. They worked with Audio Slave and, and um, people that I loved and people that I admired and, and knew exactly what I wanted to accomplish. Then it became people that were more working on the pop side of things. And, you know, we had a few songs that, that crossed over early and it kind of, you know, stuck a fork in us, you know, and, and kept us in this format. And so every a r person that came after was like, that's, that's where you live. That's the format where you live. Yet we weren't getting played on there. But if you do this song, you'll get played on there. So I would do this song and then we still weren't getting played on there. And nobody was playing guitars anymore. So I started to believe the hype. Oh, I got to do this in order to be relevant. I got to, we got to change it up. You know, nobody did the same record twice. Prince didn't do the same record twice. And uh, so I would believe these outside voices because every artist wants to be successful. And um, if you hear enough, especially when it's from your team that supposedly has your best interest, you're, you got to believe it. And then, uh, you know, we did Cage to Rattle and I thought this was our this was our chance to get back at what we do. And we're making a rock record. We got Jakir King who did Kings of Leon and Modest Mouse. He's he's going to you know make sure that we get the record we want. And the label did their thing and was like, you got to do these two songs. These are going to be your hits. These two are your hits. I mean, I'm talking adamant. These are your hits. And if you do these, you can have your way with the rest of the record. Once again, I'm like, this is my last record with the label. I'm going to play ball. They're saying that we're going to have success with it. I got to believe it. Didn't work out. None of the things they promised uh, worked out. And I took a step back. I was like, this is my last record with the label. It did what it did. I'm very proud of the songs that I wrote for this album, but it's still tainted by the ones that were kind of forced on me. And when all of that was done and I was, uh, the dust was able to settle and I was able to take a step back, I was like, what do I want to do? What made me want to do this in the first place? Who are the artists that I just loved and made me want to pick up a guitar and get in front of a microphone and sing? And, and I just started going back and listening to those older records that made me want to do this, like Facelift, Dirt, you know, Super Unknown, Bad Motor Finger, um, you know, Throwing Copper, Secret Samadhi. And 
I was like, oh my God, I started feeling alive again and feeling this rush of energy. Like this is what I wanted to do. So why am I not doing this? And now I don't have a label telling me what I can and can't do. I'm doing this. I picked my producers. I fired my manager and got, you know, a new manager and, and basically re, uh, you know, I, I basically changed my entire team and, uh, my manager now who's been my day to day for ever since the beginning, he actually started as my tour manager, but he always believed in me as a rock artist and was always kind of held back by who he worked for. And, um, and all of a sudden I I'm writing songs that make me feel alive as an artist that make me feel proud to, you know, as if I'm watching myself, I'm like, that's what I want to see me do. I feel like this is what the fans want to see me do and have wanted to see me do for, you know, since the beginning. And, um, that has been, um, the, the long story short, I don't regret anything, but it definitely informed how much I needed to be where I'm at right now as an, you know, artistically and, and it's liberating and I don't throw anybody at RCA under the bus because I'm, I'm grateful for every opportunity I had up to this point. And I feel like it taught me that I wasn't involved enough. I wasn't as an artist. I, I wasn't, I was expecting everyone to, to see my vision, but I didn't have one. If that makes any sense. I didn't have one solid enough to go, no, this is what we're doing. I was like, well, that looks cool. I guess that's cool. Nah, that should work. And then get pissed off when it didn't work out or when it didn't really visually or artistically reflect me on the inside. Um, I feel like I was expecting um, everyone to kind of facilitate that for me. And I, taking a step back, I realized that I'm in full control over it now and I get to do it, but it's a lot of fucking work and I got to actually put that work in. And that's, that's exciting to me. And I'm, I cannot wait, cannot wait for this record to come out because top to bottom, it is 100% from my soul. And, um, I think the fans are going to see that. You're in a position that a lot of people are in right now that aren't rock stars and musicians and that they're coming out of this incredibly strange time in the world and taking stock in their life and trying to figure out what it is that makes them happy, what feeds their soul, how they want to spend their day. Did the job that they have before that they did just for the money and then they haven't been able to work is now the time to reinvent themselves, take control of their own destiny. Everything that you're describing, it seems like a lot of people are are at that crossroads in their life. It just so happens that your deal with RCA kind of coincided with this shift in the world at the same yeah. time. There's a lot of life it's lessons there that, that you're living through. Absolutely. It's crazy how everything just kind of worked out. And I feel like, you know, I, it, it's not lost on me that that people are struggling, that people have lost jobs, people haven't been able to pay their bills. I think overall, it was a much needed pause for humanity. I feel like it was the thing that forces you to stop and evaluate everything up to this point. Like I'm either going to, because I feel like everyone, everyone's at this crossroads where the next move is the make it or break it. And it's kind of hard to, you know, know, that or even realize that there's something to evaluate if it's the, the same old thing every day, every day, same old life as usual, you know, um, and that's different for everybody. Um, but for me, I made hardly, I made the least amount of money in my career this year. Uh, and I couldn't be happier. Like I'm, I've been able to really I think artistically I'm the most fulfilled I've ever been. And I haven't even been able to go out and tour it or support it or, or perform it, but I'm creating something that feels exactly, it feels right. It feels real. And 
you know, it is coming to a time where I think things are kind of getting back to normal and we're going to be able to go out and tour. And I think all of it just worked out the way it should. There were a lot of discussions with musicians and their camps about how to navigate COVID. Do we just go dormant, lower expenses? Do we go and record music and get ready for when the world opens back up? Or do we release music in the middle of it because our fans are looking for a distraction? And you've kind of straddled that where you've released some new songs, but haven't released the record yet. What was your mindset of navigating those decisions, especially now that you're in total control of it? Well, we had started working on the record pre-COVID. Um, it was already, you know, in the, in the making, uh, I was in the writing phase and then COVID happened and, um, you know, it, it shut us down for a few weeks, but then we started getting back into the writing phase, whether it be, you know, um, we got a lot, we got more than half the record written before COVID and then we had a pause and then there was plenty to write about. (laughs) And, and I would come up with ideas at home and we, uh, we'd meet up. Uh, I would meet one of my producers lives out here. One lives in LA. Um, Scott Stevens from the X's, uh, and Marty Fredrickson. And so we'd have Scott on zoom and me and Marty in the studio, both wearing masks and, you know, finishing up writing. Then I'd get in the booth, I'd track. And then we finally got the band, uh, to do their parts separately it wasn't how we wanted to do it, but it, it worked out. And so we were like, this music feels too fresh and too, like we didn't want it to get stale. We didn't want it to, to lose its uh, relevance to us and, and uh, excitement. So world on fire just felt like the, the right first single because we had just written it and then COVID happened and then the George Floyd stuff happened. And then it was like, Oh my God, everything we wrote, happened it was such a weird eerie feeling and it just felt timely but we didn't want to just release it and be like oh look we wrote about everything that's going on right now but i think after when it finally released it was enough time where people had a chance to really marinate on what's happening and it and it and everything in that song meant something different to to different people and um and we talked about it a lot. We're like, do, is this the right thing to do? Do we just sit on it until the world opens back up? But the, you know, we feel like the fans have been waiting long enough. You know, they don't have, we don't have to be on the road for them to hear something new. And, uh, we just, we finally said, fuck it. We're, we'll release this and we'll start working on the next single and we'll just, we'll keep working and eventually things are going to just open back up. And then we released the second single, still waiting for things to open back up. We've already got the third one in the can. We're waiting for that. Um, we're, uh, so it was certainly a lot of conversations, but I think at the end of the day, um, there is no right or wrong answer. I think you just do what feels right for your situation and, and, and for your project. And, I think by the time the record is ready to go and mixed and mastered and ready to go, I think we'll, we'll be in a position where we can go out and actually support it and see the fans face to face again and play these new songs live. And we're, we're, we're really hoping that that all works out. Do you know when that date's going to be yet? Have you, have you, even if you haven't set it, have you set the date for the album release? Not the date, but we do have a month in mind. Yeah. Uh, it is It is later this year, definitely. Can you talk to me about the relationship with the rock community and the rock fans? And yeah. it's something that I talk about a lot on the podcast. It seems like the rock community, in a lot of ways, is kind of showing the rest of the world how to be tolerant in a lot of ways and to be open-minded yeah. about music and accepting and the longevity and the passion and the loyalty of a rock audience, there really aren't any other genres of music that, that have that same intimate personal connection with the fans. It is so visceral. Um, It's, it's so real. Uh, it, It, there was this fear 
not really a fear, but this hesitation or, or I guess, I guess there was a slight fear of, of not being embraced back into the rock community. And when we released world on fire, you know, anytime we've ever released something, there's always someone going, not what I was expecting. Wish it, wish it rocked more. Wish it was more like the first record. It was a resounding yes from everything we saw and from every station that, that supported it. And I think it's the first time in, in our career that I felt this overwhelming unified sense of acceptance, like, uh, and praise toward our project, um, at least as long as I can remember. And in talking to the stations and feeling that support from, you know, my peers like Brent and, and the Shinedown guys posting about it, the guys in Seven Dust posting about it, um, and just feeling that, that love and respect from the rock fans. And like, instead of like, no, they lost me years ago, it was more like, finally, they're back. And that felt so good that that and matt penfield and and people like that would go this is where i thought you always belonged in the first place instead of writing us off like yeah you put out a few records that that we didn't really jive with and so i think we you know we're done with you it's not like it's not like pop radio at all it it is a it's this you're right it's the only community that i've seen with my own eyes that that it's more forgiving it's more uh uh accepting as a whole and it feels it just to me it was just like proof that i was in the right place and i was doing the right thing and i was making the right choices and writing the right material and it was just this confirmation all around that that i'm where i need to be and uh, that that felt extremely satisfying. Dave Grohl gave an interview years ago about being on the road and being being backstage with like Dimebag Daryl and Vinnie Paul and how they kind of showed him like how to be a rock star, how to how to just party with everybody and just want to have fun. And the names that you're dropping and the and the the artists that you're mentioning that have been so supportive you know, the guys from Shinedown, the guys from Seven Dust, you talk about working with Slash. These are all guys that have really kind of figured out how to have that balance between creating great music, but also really enjoying the ride. Well, that story that Dave told about being around Dimebag and all those guys, we have that exact same story with Dave. And Dave um has you know supported us and and been you know on our side from day one and we we saw we saw them um you know i hadn't talked to him in years and we just happened to have a day off um and in san jose and this was obviously pre-covid and I saw that they were playing at the arena that night. And so I was like, well, I'll just text Dave. I don't even know if his number's the same. And um, obviously I everybody and he, in Tennessee doesn't have his number like they have yours. No, no, no. And uh, I text him. I was like, hey, man, long time no speak. Hope you're well. I see you're playing in town tonight. We'd love to come see it. And he's like, are you in, are you in San Jose? I was like, yeah. Invited the whole band to the show. We get there and he invites us all into his dressing room, like typical Dave fashion. And we were in his dressing room for two hours while he told stories, while he did shots with everybody, while he made sure every single person was acknowledged, while he made sure every single person felt part of his stories that he was telling. He never made anyone feel like an outsider. And this is before he has to go out there and do a two hour. I was like, dude, don't you have a show? He goes, man, what better way to go out and do a show when you're all happy and hang around with friends for two hours? 
that was something that I never did. And it was a lesson for sure for me. I was like, Oh my God, like, like this is why you do this. Like it's, it's, it was such a community and, and it felt so welcoming. I don't think any, any band has ever made us feel that welcome. And none of the band members knew anybody in there. You know, I knew Dave from, you know, being on the same label and meeting him through, you know, people years ago and at different award shows and stuff like that. And it was as if he was my best bud, you know, and, and that he was everybody's best bud. And that was something that I will never, ever forget. So he absolutely took that uh, to heart because that's how he treats everyone. And I'll tell everybody, he's the nicest rock star in the business, hands down. It is intoxicating being around him because his energy is infectious. It it does rub off. You're you're just happy around the guy. There is no way to not be. (laughs) And every story is like the best story you've heard that day. Or week, or I mean, month, or it's, year. It's Dave Grohl, the guy. I, the, and, <laughs> and what I love about him is that sometimes in music, you're not allowed to be a fan, right? That you're supposed to be yeah. like the coolest guy in the room and not a big deal. And what I love about somebody like him, or even the, the way you're telling this story, is that he still has, like when you hear him talk about being in a room with Sir Paul McCartney, he's losing his mind the way any of us would be. Being in the room with a fucking beetle. Yeah. And so he yeah. is he, legitimately still that rock fan, that kid with his album collection. He's still that way. And I think all of us, that's what makes us love this community is that at our core, we're all still those kids with the music collection too. I never want to lose that spark, that, that I, I will always remember when I saw live for the first time in 1997, on the secret Samadhi tour. And I remember watching it like I was watching a seminar and I was doing my homework. And I was like, I want to be, I want to do that for the rest of my life. I want to do that. That looks like the most liberating experience and to be able to sing like that and to be able to, to capture all of these people's attention with your songs and have them sing that back to you was such a, I'll never forget that feeling. And I, I I love when I, and I felt that way when I saw the Foo Fighters that night, because all these years, I never had seen the Foo Fighters live. And other than, you know, on television or whatever. They set a bar very high. It, I could not believe what we witnessed. It was something that, that it's hard to explain. And, and, I felt like a fan again, you know, just that, that excitement of like, I want to do this. Oh yeah, I do this. Oh my God, I get to do this, you know? And that's a, you know, I think every artist needs that reminder sometimes that like, whenever it's not fun anymore, like why even bother? Like I, I want to always feel like that, that I'm that excited that I get to do this. If that live concert is is what made you say, I want to do that, what was the rock song or the rock album that you heard growing up that made you love rock music? Do you remember? Super Unknown was transformative for me. And it was a bar that I felt was unattainable. Like Chris Cornell to me was a voice that um, it had everything. It had that low sultry tone and it had this upper register that that you only heard people like David Coverdale or or Robert Plant do but he was able to to move in between these these different colors of his voice so effort, effortlessly that I, I I was always uh, terrified to attempt it because it just felt so unattainable and he to this day is still like the bar for me as a as a vocalist and that record was like my high school soundtrack. I even had my first, uh, my first car wreck. Um, I was 16 years old, leaving football practice, flipped my car. I was driving late at night, uh, taking a, a friend home from practice, was driving this unfamiliar road, took a curve too fast, flipped my car. I wasn't even wearing a seatbelt. I had no scratches on me, 
but limo wreck was still playing in the in the tape deck <laughs> and i was like and we were upside down in a field in virginia and uh neither me and my my friend neither one of us had a scratch on us and it was like to this day like how did we survive this um it flipped three times um and it I obviously was in this wasn't hatch. a tesla it was definitely not it was a it was an 88 chevy sprint hatchback and uh that was my first car destroyed it um walked out unscathed we actually flipped it over and ace ventura uh to a to a nearby uh house to get it off the road looking out the window it was I don't, I don't even know how we did that but it happened i started asking this question when i started the the podcast and it has turned into probably my favorite question that i ask anyone i have such admiration for musical ability the creativity of playing instruments and moreover songwriting if you could name the song from any artist in any genre that you wished you wrote as a songwriter, what would it be and why? Oh, we have a list of those. Um, uh, God, there's so many. Um, in the Air Tonight is one of those songs that, that uh, we've covered so many times that it feels like it feels like ours. Like we've, we've, we've become part of this song and we've played it so many times that if people haven't heard it before until that time, they just think it's our song, but that's one that I feel like it's got the perfect amount of, it's got the hook, but it's so moody. It's so eerie. His vocal is so sick in it. Um, and it's it's a rock song, you know, it, it, at its core. And um, I, I, I'm not sure what I would have to have gone through to write such creepy lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I prefer to, uh, you know, to think that the song was about the urban legend. That, <laughs> but um, it's amazing how something like you... that went viral before viral was a thing. Right. Um, that's one of them. Uh, Purple Rain is is def. I mean, absolutely. I mean, why not? Why not write that song? <laughs> and it's Prince. Why? Why would aim high if you're going to aim? Aim high. Yes, exactly. Uh, there's so many songs that I wish I wrote. I have a. I want to do a, a covers album one day called Songs I Wish I Wrote. Um, and there and and I'm always making a list. Um, so, yeah, maybe one day we'll put that out. Um, you made an appearance on what is becoming quickly the home of rock and roll on daytime television, the Kelly Clarkson show. She's had you on, Evanescence, <laughs> The Pretty Reckless. Like They had The Pretty Reckless on there? Yes! Okay, so now I I was like, when we first got the offer, and, and I, I love Kelly, and I've, you know, we've, you know, I, I, we're not like best buds hanging out on the weekends, but we know each other. We've always been friendly with each other and we've, we've worked together before. And when I was told we were going to get to perform on there, I was like, do they do rock on daytime television? And we did it. And I couldn't believe because this is the first time I did television and I actually got to be home watching it. Um, and I was like, this feels cool and terrifying at the same time because it does not look like what they're it, it, like prepared to watch in that audience or or it just doesn't feel like that type of show but the fact that she does that that makes me have like even more respect and i didn't realize that the pretty reckless played on there that's so awesome that's what i'm trying to figure and, out and evanescence yeah. that's so cool that all of a sudden She's, we have an ally in rock in kelly clarkson on daytime television if you had told me that a year ago let's do this yes right <laughs> hell yeah yeah all right, before i let you go you got to tell me about your beer because i got some and like i told you earlier i have a video show that i do every tuesday night called cocktails in the war room i have a room in my house yeah that has all my well, military this, stuff and it's, yeah. we call it the war room and I host this show. I got some of your beer. I haven't tried it yet. Cause I wanted to talk to you about it first. 
Oh my gosh, you're going to hate me right now when I say this. I quit drinking back in December. Uh, that was one of the things that I'd been, uh, that I'd had on my list to do for the last five years. And I finally woke up one morning and said, I think I'm done. Um, however, I have no problem with anybody else drinking my beer. <laughs> and uh, it does taste really good. It's, um, you know, I've never been like a beer connoisseur. So when I was testing them out, um, I just wanted one that didn't suck. I didn't know what I was, I didn't know, it, is this too hoppy? Is this, how, you know, I didn't know the lingo. I was like, this, this doesn't taste like, you know, something that, I, I wanted a nice combination between a Bud Light and something with a little more that something with that the hipsters would <laughs> would drink, you know, <laughs> like a nice, nice little combination. And I think, um, you know, everyone who has had it told me that I accomplished that. Um, but it's very uh, it's got a little honey to it, a little ale, a little a uh, little amber. Um, and it just felt felt like it fit the whole September vibe. So. Um, now I got to come out with a non-alcoholic version for us non-drinkers, right? Well, the the show Cocktails in the War Room, I'm officially inviting you. And when we have a guest on that doesn't drink, we call it Mocktails in the War Room. And we Perfect. call what we call a Temple Tuesday and we drink Shirley Temples in your honor to encourage your sobriety for whatever reason you're sober. So yeah. you can still come on the show even though you don't drink anymore. I will. I will gladly do it. <laughs> It was so nice to finally meet you, everybody. You as well. Thank you so much. This has been like the best conversation ever. Oh, thank you. Everybody that I know that knows you told me that I would love you when I met you finally, and I just haven't, and they were totally right. So it was really nice to get oh, to know you. Thank you. I really And likewise, I wish I could give you a big I air know. hug. Soon, I mean, yeah. I'm vaccinated. A so, real hug, real hug. Yeah, so when you come out on tour, I know you've released a few dates, are you going to wait to do a whole tour in the new year after the record comes out? What What's in your head as far as getting you out on the road nationally? We have something in the works right now that if it pans out, you and the fans are going to be super stoked. So we're, we're, we're in the, we're in the state, like the stages of planning this right now and making sure that, that venues are, are, or a go and that capacity, you know, we're, we're still working out the logistics, but th there is something in the works that if it does work out and I really hope it does, it's going to be the coolest package that we've done in a very long time. Well, I will put you down as an IOU for a hug when the package comes to yes. town. And I actually get and to likewise. You Thank you so much. It was so great to well, see you. Congratulations on everything. And, uh, I'll hit you up to get you in the war room when you're ready to drop the record and announce the tour and you got all kinds of cool I'm stuff gonna, to talk about. Well, I'm going to hit that follow button on Instagram so you can just DM me there. Awesome. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank Have you a so great much. rest of your day. All right. Thanks, Gary. See ya. Bye. There he is, the one and only Chris Daughtry. As soon as I get more details on when he's going to release this new album, I will definitely let you know. And I can't wait to have him join us for Cocktails in the War Room, which is my video show at 8.30 Eastern every Tuesday night live on my Facebook page. Now, if you like the episode, don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss anything from the Mistress Carrie podcast. Full-length episodes come out every Wednesday. Plus, every weekday, you get the sit rep which is all of your rock news and music headlines in less than five minutes. And if you don't mind, give us a five-star review and leave us a comment to let us know what you thought of the episode. Now, if you go into the show notes of this episode, you'll get the corresponding playlist, which is filled with all of Daughtry's music and all of the other music we talked about in the episode. Plus, you'll get all of the links to get a hold of Chris Daughtry on social, the band's links, and info on his beer. Plus, you'll get all of my social links as well. Huge thanks once again to our sponsors, Digital Federal Credit Union at dcu.org slash careers because they're hiring right now. And also, mistresscarry.com. The Mistress Carrie podcast is a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network.